Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mike Pesco, a tobacco control researcher at Georgia State University. TOPS is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, C. Shang from the Ohio State University, and Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. For this presentation, we will allow questions to be posted either publicly or privately. Publicly posted questions may be discussed by the presenter, the presenter's co-author, myself, and others. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Public posts that are not particularly germane to the research question will be dismissed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, C. Sheng from the Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. Catherine McLean will lead a single paper presentation entitled The Effects of E-Cigarette Taxes on E-Cigarette Prices and Tobacco Product Sales, Evidence from Retail Panel Data. Dr. McLean is an associate professor in the economics department of Temple University. Her research uses health and labor economic theory to empirically explore the causes and consequences of substance use, mental health, insurance coverage, and labor market outcomes. She is particularly interested in the role of public policies in influencing these outcomes. Dr. McLean is a research associate in the health economics program at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a research affiliate at the Institute of Labor Economics. She is a co-editor at the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management and associate editor of the Journal of Health Economics. Dr. McLean's research has been supported by the National Institutes of Health, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, and the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Dr. Michael Pascoe, who is also an author of this paper, will respond to selected Q&As. Our discussion today is Dr. Sherry Emery. She is a senior fellow of public health and director of social data collaboratory at the NORC at the University of Chicago. Dr. McLean will be presenting her research in three segments. We will have pauses after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. McLean, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you so much for that great introduction, C. And thank you everyone for joining us and spending part of your Friday with us. I'm really excited to talk about this joint research that uh, C has just given the title. Uh, I have five great co-authors on this paper, Chad Cotty, Charles Colomache, Eric Neeson, Mike Pesca, who's here with us today, and Nathan Teff. Uh, this is very much a collaborative effort and they are just fantastic colleagues. Um, a second. Uh, my disclosure, uh, this research is funded by uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, this is an R01. The PI is Mike Pesco. Uh, I have had no tobacco related funding over the past 10 years. Uh, also, just a disclaimer, we use Nielsen scanner data. Uh, this is the standard disclosure that the data provider requires uh, us to provide with each paper. So just to begin, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give a summary of the research questions, the research findings, just because uh, research papers are not mystery novels. So uh, our research questions are three, they are interrelated. We want to look at, do e-cigarette taxes affect e-cigarette prices? This is often referred to as the pass-through rate. That is our higher taxes passed on to consumers in the form of higher prices. We also want to look to see whether exogenous changes in e-cigarette prices affect e-cigarette sales. Similarly, do these changes in prices affect the sales of other tobacco products? We're going to focus on sales of tobacco products at retail stores in the United States between 2011 and 2017. We are going to view these sales as a proxy for consumption. So the paper will take two steps we will look at the effect of taxes on prices, and then we will look at the effect of prices on sales. Uh, we are going to look at 
e-cigarette tax is adopted by eight, city, eight states and three counties over our study period, we will apply very standard two-way fixed effects uh, regression models and instrument, instrumental variable models that I'll outline later. And we also think uh, a contribution of our study, as I'll mention why this is important, is we're going to develop a method to standardize e-cigarette taxes, which we think is potentially useful to the research community at large. Just a bit of the uh, preview of the results, our deep theory that we have in mind here. Uh, first, again, the two parts of the paper, effect of taxes on prices, then the effect of prices on sales. In terms of e-cigarette taxes, we think that when a tax is passed, it will pa be passed on to consumers in terms of higher prices. They will face higher prices at retail sales, uh, retail, uh, retail stores following the tax increase. We think that this is potentially um, not surprising, but we would like to quantify this effect because there are reasons to believe um, that the prices could be, the taxes could be overshifted or undershifted to consumers. We also want to look at the effect of taxes and sales on other tobacco products. So we're going to be looking at taxes that exogenously increase prices, which will go on to potentially impact sales. Uh, we think that this is going to be determined by the relationships between these different goods. Are e-cigarettes and other and tobacco products, are they uh, economic substitutes? That is, consumers use one or the other. Are they economic complements? That is, consumers use these products together, or are they unrelated? And these are things that we're going to speak about and speak to in this paper. Our findings, we find that e-cigarette prices are passed on to consumers in terms of higher prices. We are going to find that e-cigarette sales decline when prices are exogenously increased by taxes. We will also find that cigarette, uh, traditional cigarette sales are going to increase when prices are exogenously increased through taxes, through these e-cigarette taxes. So uh, we, we do a bit more in the paper, but this is what we're going to be focusing on today. The, the talk will take a very standard uh, outline. I'll go th through some background. I think this audience is probably quite familiar with e-cigarettes, so I'll be brief talk about our data, our methods, summarize the findings, and then give an interpretation about what this might mean, uh, in particular what it might mean for the regulation of these different products. So just some background on e-cigarettes. Again, I'm quite sure that this audience is very familiar with these products. Uh, they, they are relatively recent products in the US tobacco markets, at least compared to a traditional cigarette. They entered in roughly 2006. Um, they are quite popular. I've uh, just got some statistics here from the CDC and FDA, about 4.5% of adults and 27.5% of youth vaped in 2019. These products are generally believed to be less harmful than smoking or consuming traditional tobacco products. Although these products are somewhat controversial. Now we don't take a stand uh, on this issue within the paper. We just acknowledge that it exists. Uh, there are benefits to these products. They could be harm reduction benefits. That is, individuals can consume nicotine in a less harmful manner than other tobacco products by using e-cigarettes. Uh, e-cigarettes may be used as a pathway to cessation for some individuals. On the other hand, there are concerns about potential harms of e-cigarettes. There are concerns about the, the fact that e-cigarettes could potentially renormalize smoking. And maybe these health benefits that I've just noted, perhaps they're overstated. Again, this is not something we take a stand on in the paper, but we acknowledge this controversy exists within, with, in relation to these products. There is a, some literature that is related to ours. Uh, just briefly review this. We are not the only paper that is looking at the impact of e-cigarette taxes on the outcomes that I'm mentioning here, but we do think that we make some unique contributions, which I'll outline on the next slide. There is a paper by Alcott and Rifkin, which will be presented in our series later on. Um, this, uh, this paper uses a shift share strategy to examine how e-cigarette use in, uh, impacts smoking. So looking at the introduction of e-cigarettes and how that impacted smoking. Uh, they, they also estimate a pass-through rate. This is the rate at which taxes are passed onto consumers um, and, and own price elasticity. And in some of their specifications, their findings are fairly similar to those that I will show you. There's also another paper by Mike and I. Mike and I, this is Pesco et al. 2020. Chuck Colomanche is also on this paper. Uh, this, looks, this paper looks at the effect of e-cigarette taxes on adult e-cigarette e and traditional cigarette use using survey data. So we will be using sales data. This paper here looks at survey data, so reports to major health surveys. The methods are quite similar to what we use, and they find that higher e-cigarette taxes reduce daily e-cigarette use and increase daily traditional cigarette use 
amongst uh, adults. Finally, there's a paper by Safer et al. Uh, this paper uses um, a related approach to what we're going to be using in this paper. It's referred to as synthetic control methods. Uh, they apply these survey data and they focus on the state of Minnesota. Minnesota was the first state or the first locality in the US to adopt an e-cigarette tax. And they look at the impact of that tax on adult smoking and cessation uh, using survey data. What they find is that higher e-cigarette e taxes increase adult smoking and reduce adult smoking cessation. They also estimate a comparable pass-through rate to what I'm going to show you in our paper. I also want to caveat uh, that there is just a massive tobacco control literature. Uh, we, address, we address it more in more detail in the paper, but there are many, many papers out there um, and we are only focusing on some here. But what are the takeaways from these three related studies that I've just shown you? We've, these studies suggest collectively that e-cigarette taxes are passed on to the consumer in the form of higher prices. They also suggest that vaping or e-cigarette use declines when e-cigarette prices are increased through taxes. They also find that higher e-cigarette tax will, uh, will lead to increases in adult smoking and reductions in adult smoking cessation. What are our contributions to this literature? Uh, we think all of these papers are important. Uh, we are certainly fans of these other authors, but we do think that our paper is able to make uh, some contributions relative to this existing literature. We are focusing on retail sales data, so we might be less concerned about misreporting that you might find in survey data. We also develop a method that we think can be used by other researchers to standardize e-cigarette taxes, which as we, I will show you in a few slides, we believe to be quite important for studying the impact of taxes on these products. We also consider a wide range of tobacco products. I'll show you a subset of what we, act, we look in the, at in the full paper to, uh, later today. We also examine whether the effect of an exogenous price change on tobacco product use we are able to use a longer study period than some of these studies, and that arguably allows us to better test some of the key assumptions of our research design, which I'll discuss later. We also leverage the experiences of a broad set of localities, so we're not looking at the impact of a single state uh, policy adoption. We're going to look at eight states and three counties over our study period. So we feel that these are contributions to this literature. So just a bit on e-cigarette taxes. Uh, so e-cigarette taxes, um, they have been adopted by, as I mentioned during our study period, eight states and three counties. These localities, we refer to a state or a county as a locality, a locality adopted e-cigarette taxes in different ways. This is somewhat distinct from traditional cigarette taxes where the products are uh, taxed in a similar way. Some of the localities used ad valorem taxes on wholesalers. Others use e-cigarette uh, excise taxes at the point of purchase. Now, these differential types of taxes complicate analysis of these taxes because they are quite di different and you're not comparing apples to apples, you're comparing apples to oranges and that's just challenging. So what do we do? Well, we develop a way to standardize these taxes, to put them all in the same unit so we can compare them and in particular we can take advantage of the fact that some of these taxes are much larger than other, tax, than other taxes and we want to allow for that and use that variation in our empirical models. So what do we do? We take advantage of the fact that the District of Columbia equalizes the e-cigarette ad valorem tax with the traditional, uh, traditional cigarette tax. What this allows us to do this allows us to calculate that a one percentage point of ad valorem tax is roughly 4.4 cents. So we use this conversion factor that is established by DC, and we're going to use this relationship to convert all of our ad valorem taxes to an excise tax per milliliter of vaping liquid. So we have an apples to apples comparison for all of the states. We have an appendix in our paper that walks through all the gory details of how we do this, but that is the um, main a broad summary of what we're doing. We think this is important because when we, once we standardize these units, we find that there is, as I just mentioned, a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the size of the tax, and we want to exploit that in our empirical models. For example, we see that in Kansas and Louisiana, two of our adopting localities, the tax is five cents per milliliter of vaping liquid. However, at the other extreme, in Minnesota, we see that the tax is $1.85 per um, milliliter in Minnesota. Just some sources here uh, for where we locate these taxes. This is uh, a geographic depiction 
of the taxes that we're going to use. This is just uh, the, a picture of taxes at the end of our study period. So the fourth quarter of 2017, and we're gonna look at this as the dollar per milliliter of vaping liquid. You can see that the, the taxes, while they're not in all states, of course, we do have reasonably good geographic variation across the United States. Uh, and these are, one might think about them as the early adopting states. This is a temporal depiction of the rollout of taxes across, uh, across the localities that we study. This is just the number of legislative tax changes in each year of our study period. Through the equalization process that I just mentioned to you, we actually have more variation in the data, but these are the legislative changes. So what you can see is that most of the changes are occurring at the end of our study period. Now, this is just a feature of how these taxes rolled out across the United States but this is the variation that we were able to utilize in our empirical models. So what data do we use to measure sales and prices? We're going to take advantage of the Nielsen Retail Scanner data. This is a survey of approximately 30 to 35,000 retailers each year. Uh, now, one thing we note in the paper is that we focus on retail sales. We have a discussion as to why we think that this is uh, a reasonable depiction of e-cigarettes that are sold in other, look, in other situations like vape shops or online. Uh, happy to get into that a little bit later if people have questions. In 2017, the last year of our data, we find that we have re reasonably good depiction of the uh, sales across different types of stores. We have 15 to 26% of food stores, mass merchandise or dollar store and club store sales, over 50% of drugstore sales, 2% of convenience and liquor stores, we also believe that we are including some jewel sales. Um, they represented about a third of the market by the end of 2017. Our data records weekly volume and average price. This is including all taxes except sales taxes of each UPC purchased. Um, we are able to calculate the millimeters, milliliters of vaping liquid in each e-cigarette UPC. We are able to match almost 95% of the products in the uh, Nielsen Retail Scanner data. So to, uh, in our calculation. So now I'm gonna go through the method. So as I mentioned, we have our, our paper takes on two, two parts. We look at the effect of taxes on prices, and then we'll move on to looking at the effect of prices on sales. So I'm gonna talk about the methods that we use to study that first part of the analysis. Again, our research question here is our e-cigarette taxes passed on to consumers in the form of higher taxes. We apply two-way fixed effects regression models I have the regression model written down here. We have an e-cigarette price for a UPC code in a locality in a time period. We measure the e-cigarette tax. This is the standardized measure that I just explained to you. We have the traditional cigarette tax. We also have a number of covariates that include other tobacco control policies and other policies in the locality level. These vary across locality or within locality over time. We have locality um, by, uh, UP, sorry, UPC by locality fixed effects, time fixed effects, and this is just our error term here at the end. So some other technical details about the, um, the methods. We have over 70,000 UPC locality quarters. Uh, we, we apply weighted least squares regression models. We have 48 states, DC, and two counties. These are our localities. We combine Chicago and Cook County, Illinois, because we can't really separate them in our data. We do not include Alaska and Hawaii because they are not included in our Nielsen, our Nielsen data. And we're gonna cluster our standard errors by the locality level. I just wanna pause for a moment to think about what we're doing here in this regression model. I've called it two-way fixed effects when this uh, method is also referred to as a differences and differences model. At its very basic idea, you can think about having um, one a treatment group and a comparison group. This is often, refer, often described as being akin to a randomized control trial with pre and post intervention periods. So let's think about just one state that adopts a tax or one locality that adopts a tax and one that does not. So what we will do is we will observe both of those localities, the treated and the comparison, pre-tax and then post-tax. What we will do is we will compare the change over time in those two localities. We will use the trend for the comparison count, the comparison locality as the counterfactual trend for the treated locality. So we will pretend that 
the trend that we observe between pre and post tax for the locality that did not adopt a tax, the comparison group. That trend is the trend that the treated locality would have followed had it not adopted the tax. The difference between the real trend, what we observe in the treated group, and the pretend or counterfactual trend, that difference in trend, as you can observe down here, this is what we refer to as the differences in differences or two-way fixed effects uh, regression model coefficient estimate. This will be our estimate of the treatment uh, effect. So we're going to use those localities that did not adopt the tax, their trend as the hypothetical or counterfactual trend for those localities that did. And the difference will represent the effect of the tax. Uh, next, I'll move on to just talking about our sales analysis. So again, we're proceeding in two steps. Now what we're going to be looking at is what is the effect of, of prices that are exogenously increased by taxes on sales. Um, we are going to combine the same method that I just described to you, the two-way fixed effects regression model with an instrumental variable approach. In this approach, and we talk about exactly why we do this, we aggregate the data somewhat differently. We're going to aggregate the data. Again, it will still be our Nielsen scanner data from retail, set, retail stores. We're going to aggregate this to the state, the locality by year level. And we're gonna have about 14, well, we will have exactly 1,428 observations. What we will do is we will find a variable that predicts taxes, that predicts prices. We will use taxes as our instrument. So for e-cigarette prices, we will instrument them with e-cigarette taxes. For traditional cigarette prices, we will instrument them with traditional cigarette taxes. So we're going to use exogenous changes in prices that are influenced by the adoption of these taxes that I've just described. So to make this a little bit more clear, what I've drawn here is this is just a, a, de a depiction of what, we are, what we're doing here. The key assumption or the assumption that we are potentially most concerned about in the instrumental variable framework is going to be the a violation of what is referred to of the exclusion restriction. So what we want is we want to find a variable which we are going to use the tax, the tax that leads to changes in prices. We expect that prices will increase following a tax adoption and this will lead to potentially a change in sales. So this pathway that I'm depicting with the checks, this is good for our IV framework. What we assume is that there's no direct relationship between taxes and prices. That's why I've drawn this X through this direct pathway. Uh, so we are assuming things like signals that might be sent by, the, by a tax if a tax is adopted and people think that the product is now more risky, we're gonna assume that pathway away. That is a strong assumption, but that is what we are assuming in our IV model. So I think, would this be a good time for a, a pause, see? Yes, yes. Um, so today our discussion is Dr. Sherry Amory. Sherry, please take away. Oh, thank you. Um, so far, I think I'm, I have no critiques and I defer my questions to the people who still are card carrying economists about the measurement and um, use of the sales data because um, so far the methods that you've described I'm super impressed with and I really appreciate the contribution of creating the standardized measure and making it easy for the rest of us who aren't as deeply into the weeds to continue to do research on e-cigarette products. So I'll defer to C or to Mike to handle some of the Q&A or to Catherine. Thank you. Sure, I think uh, we can have a discussion regarding the conversion of the volume taxes to uh, similar to specific taxes. So we have two questions. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, what was the DC spaces for their equalization and how sensitive are those assumptions embedded in the equalization in terms of rank ordering or magnitude of state taxes using it? And another audience uh, raised the question that California also performs a similar conversion to attempt to equalize its e-cigarette tax to cigarette tax, but they arrive at a higher per point figure than DC. So 59% on wholesale e-cigarettes uh, is about two, is equalized to $2.87 per pack on cigarettes. How does the choice to use DC instead of CA affect your results? Can you comment on that? Um, sure, I guess I'll, I'll handle the uh, California question first. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I, 
after we had completed this draft of this paper, um, you know, we started thinking more carefully about the California tax. And in more recent work, we are including, we're using both the DC and the California equalization uh, in, our, in our calculations. And in that work, um, it's not really making a lot of difference. However, when we go, when we return to this paper, uh, it's currently under review at a journal. I think that's something that we will be thinking more carefully about. But in work that we have done, not on this specific paper, but still in the same space of standardizing the taxes using the different calculations, it hasn't made um, much of an empirical difference. But I think that's an important innovation. And going forward, we will be using that. So using the experiences of California as well. So I think it's a great comment. It's not in this paper, but I do not think that it's driving our results. Um, so I hope that answers that question. I think the second, the first question that I'm answering out of order, that was more about the motivation behind the linking of, or the equalizing of the DC ESIG to TSIG tax. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the political motivations. Um, I guess my sense is, although Mike can speak if he has a different opinion, is sort of just to kind of treat the taxes, treat the products equally. Um, I will say one thing we have done, a big concern of ours was the, the assumptions that were embedded behind using the DC experience in our conversion. We have done um, a number of robustness checks that I'll mention later on, where we try and sort of exclude, we exclude the states where we do the conversion to see if our conversion is driving our results. Uh, we exclude states one by one. Um, we've tried to symmetrically sort of remove states that we think might be problematic. And our results are uh, very robust in terms of this pass-through rate that I'm going to show you. So while I certainly cannot rule out that ass some assumptions in this conversion um, may, may, may impact our findings, in all the work that we've done, we haven't seen any empirical evidence that that is the case. Okay, uh, so let's answer one more Q&A. Sure. And so uh, one audience says, uh, is there any structural reason to assume that cigarette taxes would affect e-cigarette prices? as it is included in the tax pass-through regression model. What is the expected sign of the coefficient in this case? Um, so I think that question is what is, uh, so I think we've thought a lot, if I'm understanding this, correct, this question correctly, we have thought a lot about this. This is what is the effect of the traditional cigarette tax on the e-cigarette, um, on e-cigarettes. Uh, we do look at that. We f actually find that when that these are, these products are economic uh, substitutes. So we find when we find when the price of um, one, in, one increases the consumption or the sales of the other uh, increases through this substitutability. Um, so we have thought about that and I, I'm going to show you a bit of that later on. I'm, I'm hoping that addressed the question. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, shall I proceed, see? Yes, please. Great. Okay. Thank you all for these great questions. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you uh, the findings from the two, the two uh, portions of the paper, the price part, and then the sales part. Um, what I've done is I've converted all of our regression coefficients, which are in table format in the paper, I've converted them to, uh, to a graphical format, which I'm hoping is going to be easier for you all to, to visualize. I just want to spend a moment to tell you how the figures are going to work because they're all going to follow the same structure. What I will show you is the black diamond, that will be a regression coefficient. And then the vertical bars surrounding it, those will be the 95% confidence intervals. So all, all uh, figures will follow that format. So this is our pass-through analysis. What is the effect of e-cigarette tax, tax increases on our prices? Uh, the, we're going to be looking at $1 increases in the e-cigarette tax. So what we see here is that uh, across the X, what I have is I have a series of models. These are models that progressively include um, uh, more and more covariates until we get to model four, which this is the regression, our full regression model, our preferred specification that includes all of the covariates that I showed you in our regression model. What we have on the y axis here, this is just the price change. So I'm just going to focus on model four, which is our preferred specification. What we find is that a $1 increase in the e-cigarette tax rate leads to a $1.49, a $1.49 increase in the price. So this is suggesting that e-cigarette taxes are more than passed on to um, e-cigarette prices. So this is that a dollar tax increase leads to a more than $1 increase in the price. And the, the results are fairly robust across these different specifications that we've estimated here. So this is our pass-through analysis. 
uh, just to talk about one of the key assumptions of the uh, two-way fixed effects regression model. As I said earlier, what we're, what we're doing here is we're using the trend in the states that do not adopt one of these e-cigarette taxes as the counterfactual trend for the localities that did adopt a tax in the post-intervention period. Uh, so the key assumption of this model is referred to as the parallel trends assumption. This essentially means that using the trend for the untreated areas, uh, that is a reasonable thing to do. That trend for the untreated areas is a good hypothetical or counterfactual for what the treated areas would have looked like had they not been treated. One way to test that is to test for differential pretrends prior to the intervention, that is the tax in both the uh, treatment and the comparison groups. We test this as a standard in the literature through what is referred to as an event study. We focus on the event, which is the adoption of the tax, and we construct policy leads, which are indicators between being in the pre-intervention period and being a treatment locality. We construct these policies leads, and then we construct policy lags, where lags are indicators for being the num number, a specific number of quarters um, after the uh, intervention and being in a being a treatment locality. If we look at the policy leads, this can inform us about whether we observe differential trends between the treated and the untreated localities prior to the intervention. If we observe no evidence of differential pretrends, this can provide suggestive evidence that the data satisfy the parallel trends assumption and that we are able to recover causal estimates using our two-way fixed effects regression model. Uh, the, our setting here is somewhat more complicated because we have a pseudo-continuous treatment variable, that is our tax. Um, we've, done, we've done some slight modifications that I'm happy to talk to you about. We've also estimated what is more a more standard event study, it's in the paper. Our interpretation of this event study, so what I've done here is I've visually divided the sample into the leads, which are on the left, and then the lags, which are on the right, we observe, we do not observe evidence of differential pretrends between the tax adopting and non adopting localities prior to tax adoption, which suggests that the data can satisfy the parallel trends. And then the post intervention period, which is on the right hand side, we see that the prices, again, this is our pass through regression, they're increasing and they seem to be increasing over time into the post period. So we, we interpret this as uh, suggestive evidence that our design is, is not invalid. Um, now I'm going to move on to our sales analysis. So what we're doing here is we're combining those two-way fixed effects regression models with an instrumental variable strategy. I'm only going to report the e-cigarette price results here. Everything else is in the paper and I'm happy to talk about it. I just don't think we have quite enough time in our, um, in our talk today. So what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you a series of regressions where we are regressing a measure of sales on prices on e-cigarette prices, where those prices are instrumented with the e-cigarette taxes. So I've just shown you the taxes lead to increases in prices, and now we're gonna use that variation and we're going to estimate the effect of the prices that are exogenously increased by taxes and how those prices change sales of the different tobacco products. I'm gonna show you three figures of different types of tobacco products. What I have here in this figure is I'm going to look at e-cigarette sales and traditional cigarette sales. Um, once I get through these three figures, I'm going to put the, uh, inter uh, put the, uh, the estimates into the form of elasticity so we can think more about magnitudes. Um, <clears throat> so again, these figures are gonna follow the same format. What we see generally, um, the scaling is not great here um, because they're just quite different magnitudes, but what we observe is that when prices are exogenously increased through taxes, that is when the e-cigarette tax increases, prices increase, we see a decline in e-cigarette sales. The, our sales are measured as the number of sales per 100,000 adults in each state. And so what this, what this coefficient estimate here, it is a negative 356 per 100,000. If we compare that to the baseline mean, that suggests that a $1 increase in the tax leads to about a 29% reduction in sales. Now over here on the right-hand panel of this figure, we're looking at traditional cigarette sales. So what we're seeing is that traditional cigarette sales are increasing when the e-cigarette price is exogenously raised through a tax. Um, and this is roughly an 18% increase in tobacco cigarette sales when the price, when the tax, sorry, when the price increases by one, uh, $1. So um, what we're seeing is taxes increase, e-cigarette sales decline, e-cigarette prices increase, and then the, uh, the, tobacco, sorry, the, the, the tobacco cigarette sales 
uh, also, or, or they rise. Next, what I'm going to look at is we're going to look specifically at e-cigarettes, but we're going to look at e-cigarettes by different types of flavoring. So we're going to look at e-cigarettes that have no flavor. We will look at e-cigarettes in the middle panel here that are menthol or mint flavor. And we will also look at e-cigarettes that are other flavors. So these could be things like coffee, fruit, um, one of the many, many flavors that are available. So these are all e-cigarette sales, but we're going to look across the products in term by their, uh, by their flavor. And what we see is that when the prices increase through the increase in the taxes, we see that all of them are declining. Uh, we might think that the reduction in the other flavors, so these are things like um, coffee and so forth, um, though these maybe de the decline might be particularly large. This is about a 40, uh, let me see, about a 41% reduction in the, in the sales. We might also think that these flavored products, which are more likely to be consumed by youth versus adults, perhaps might be better able to capture that market in, uh, by looking at this heterogeneity. We can now look at traditional cigarettes and I'm just dividing them up into no flavor or flavor. Uh, flavor here would be, would be menthol. And we see that when the e-cigarette prices increase through taxes, we see that these products, the sales of both of these products are increasing. Uh, what we've also done is we've tried to look at the market structure. That is, we want to see how concentrated is the e-cigarette market uh, in over our study period. We calculate a herfindahl heishman index or an HHI for retail sales. We find that the value is 0.245. If you look at, if you compare this number to what the Department of Justice considers a um, moderately concentrated market, the Department of Justice says that a, an HHI index of 0.15 to 0.25 is moderately concentrated. So we find evidence here that the e-cigarette ma market in retail stores is moderately concentrated over our study period. The average is 0 0.245, 0 uh, 0.245, but we do see some changes over time that may be declining um, in the later half of our study period. We've done a number of different robustness checks, which I've mentioned here. Our results are quite robust. Uh, we've also looked at some product characteristics um, like the probability of a new product entering. We don't see any changes in product characteristics over our study period when we see an increase in uh, the price. Would this be a good time for a pause? It's perfect. So Sherry, do you have any comments? Sure, I am gonna save my substantive comments for the end after we've gone through kind of all of the findings because I have some uh, thoughts about policies and um, and youth e-cigarette use and the implications. But I think I'm interested to hear, Catherine, you discuss a little bit of um, Rosalie's question about um, whether there's variation in the conversion rates across um, across localities? Um, so I'm not 100% sure if I understand the question, but we apply the same conversion factor across all of the localities. We just use the equalization in DC and then we take the ad valorem, if you are an ad valorem locality, and we apply that conversion factor based on your ad valorem. There's Sorry. No oh. The reason why it was a confusing question is because I communicated it poorly. Um, what Rosalie asked was if there was differences in the pass-through by locality, not the conversion rate. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, th thanks for that clarification. Uh, I just will finish saying, because I don't think I was quite clear on this, we only do this conversion if if the locality has an ad valorem. So we leave the, um, the, uh, the excise or per unit taxes as they are. What we have done to speak to Rosalie's question, which is very good, is we've conducted what I would call a leave one out analysis. So we've sequentially dropped each of the treated localities. These are the, the eight states and the, um, I guess in our empirical models, because we're combining Cook, uh, Cook County and Chicago into one and the two counties, um, when we sequentially drop each of those and re-estimate our pass-through regression, um, we don't observe any real difference in the, uh, in the pass-through rate. What this test allows us to say is if our, our is to shed some suggestive light on whether or not one or two or one specific state is really driving our results. 
uh, we don't find that. And as I said, we've taken out the ad valorem, used just those with the, the localities with the excise taxes to, um, to estimate the pass-through. We've done the reverse. Uh, our view is that the results are quite robust to everything that we've thrown at it. Um, we'd love to hear some other suggestions, but what, from what we can see, while we certainly acknowledge that there are assumptions in our conversion factor, all of the probing that we've done, because um, that's a great question, um, and we have, we have heard it from others because it is a great question, um, we, haven't, we can't see any evidence that these assumptions you know, are fully explaining our results. What we've done, uh, all that we have done has led to very similar conclusions about the, the pass-through rate. Did you um, examine whether the pass-through rate differed by type of store in the sales data? I know you don't have vape shops in there, but it, um, I think Rosalie was referring to not just the locations, but um, the, the types of retail outlets. We have not done that. That's a great question. I think, yeah. I think we could do that. That's a, that's a great idea. Thank you, Rosalie. We haven't done that. Okay. Uh, Shall I continue? Yes. Great, thank you so much for those questions. Uh, so just a bit of a summary of the findings, um, then leave some time for, for more of these great questions. Um, so what have we found here? Um, again, we have two prongs to our, our analysis. We looked at the pass-through rate. What is, how, to what extent are e-cigarette taxes passed on to e-cigarette prices um, to consumers? That is, if the tax increases, do we see a higher price? We found that taxes are overshifted with 148% pass through. This implies that a $1 increase in the e-cigarette tax leads to a $1.49 higher price faced by consumers in these retail shops that we're looking at. This is suggestive evidence that the e-cigarette market is not perfectly competitive. We talk in the paper about sort of some nuances and complexities when thinking about pass through, um, but this is one, this is one interpretation. This, uh, assumption that the e-cigarette market is not perfectly competitive is, su competitive is supported by our HHI calculation. Uh, just to clarify, um, in a perfectly competitive market, we would, we would expect uh, the pass-through rate to be between zero and one, although if you sort of allow for interrelated goods, it can get more complicated. But we are observing a pass-through rate greater than one, which is at least um, in line with an, uh, an, a market that is not perfectly com competitive. We find that the demand for e-cigarettes is inelastic. Um, when we put this into an elasticity calculation, where an elasticity is just the ratio of a percent change in the outcome over the percent change in the uh, predictor variable. So this would be change in the sales of e-cigarettes over the change in the price of, of e-cigarettes. We find that the elasticity is greater than one. So prices are relatively uh, sales are relatively responsive to changes in prices. And when prices increases, increase, sales decline. When we look at our, the relationship between e-cigarettes and traditional cigarettes, we find evidence that they are economic substitutes. So this means that consumers will use one product or the other. So when we see an increase in the price of the e-cigarettes, e-cigarette uh, sales will decrease and traditional cigarette sales will increase. So consumers are substituting between the two. Um, we see that the, and vice versa. We see that traditional, the traditional cigarette cross price elasticity is 1.4. The e-cigarette cross price elasticity is 0 0.8. So consumers are using one product or the other. When the price of one increases, they substitute to the other. This is, as I'll touch on in the next slide, this is a really complicated question when thinking about regulating these goods. The demand for traditional cigarettes is elastic, is inelastic. I didn't show you this, but this is in the paper. We just didn't have time to go over everything that we did in the paper. The elasticity is minus 0.8. And just for comparison, in particular, this traditional cigarette uh, tax elasticity is fairly similar to um, some other studies in the literature. And we think that broadly our findings are comparable to other studies that I've mentioned to you. They're not identical, but we don't think they're completely out of uh, out of scope. So just to conclude, uh, what, what are we doing here? We're offering new evidence on the e-cigarette market. We're looking at these relationships between these tobacco products and we're empirically studying e-cigarette taxes. So an important limitation of our study 
is that we are focusing on retail sales locations. We have some discussions about in the paper about why we think this is reasonable to think about what, the, what these relationships might look like in vape shops or through online purchases, which we don't, which we do not study. Our understanding is that taxes operate in the same way in these different venues. Uh, so we do not, we can't see a reason why the results should be markedly different from our retail setting to these other settings that I've just described, the vape shops or the online sales. Uh, we've done some sort of exploration in another data set where we have data on individuals who, who purchase products in different locations. And that has not suggested that we should expect that the findings we have here for the retail sales will be wildly different from other settings like the vape shops or online, at least during our study period, 2011 to 2017. So I think that potentially something that for me is important about the findings. Um, and this has, been this has been documented by other studies, both you know, looking at um, the, the policies we're looking at and other related policies of e-cigarettes, is that the interrelationships between e-cigarettes and traditional cigarettes uh, complicate regulation. The, these goods are linked. As we describe here, we're finding evidence that they are substitutes. So if you tax one of these products, it's going to have an impact on the demand for the quantity demanded of another product. In particular, what we're seeing is if you tax e-cigarettes, sales for e-cigarettes will decline. Commensurately, the sales for traditional cigarettes will increase. Now, the policymaker has a very challenging job, but I think the relations between these two types of products are important to recognize when thinking about designing optimal policy. Um, and if we think that there are differences in risks across the two types of products, e-cigarettes and traditional cigarettes, um, if we tax one, the substitution to the other, in particular, a movement from e-cigarettes to traditional cigarettes could be concerning. So um, we don't have certainly the answer in this paper, but we do think that our findings, in particular, the substitutability of the two products could be useful for policymakers as they are thinking about developing an optimal set of policies that will lead to better public health. So I think that's all that I have. Um, and I would love to have comments from Sherry and from our audience members. Thank you, Catherine. Or Sherry, um, and a last. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I think we've addressed most of the Q&A questions. Um, there's a couple that let's touch on and then I have a couple of just broader kind of top of the trees policy level uh, thoughts about contextualizing your findings. So it looks like Emmanuel is asking um, about the own price elasticity in cigarettes is about twice as high than the consensus estimates. Do you have any concern about that? Um, so, sorry, for the um, traditional cigarettes, is that what you said? Yes, yes. Um, sure, I think that there, it, it is potentially, I think I misspoke when I said this, it, could, it is a bit high, although when we look at other studies that are from a similar period, there are some that are um, within, that are, are similar to ours, but we do know that there is heterogeneity across studies. Um, you know, I, I think that a, a a close comparison across studies would be valuable, but this is what we are finding in our sales data. And there certainly are estimates that are lower and there are estimates that are more similar. Okay. I'm gonna go through the two others because they're kind of related. Estelle sure. notes that um, the price elasticity of cigarettes seems pretty small and could it be related to the fact that there was no major change in cigarette excise taxes during that period um, or that uh, cigarettes, which I think probably e-cigarettes, are more likely to be sold in non-retail venues? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we do have some non-trivial uh, cigarette, traditional cigarette hikes uh, during our study period. Um, uh, so I, I don't know if that will fully explain it. Um, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but they're, uh, they're, if they're not reported in the paper, then I, I certainly have them. Um, so I'm not sure if that would explain it. Um, Again, uh, I can't think off the top of my head if the taxes are applied similarly in other settings, why they would be markedly different, but I think that's a really good question that we could think about more. Okay, okay. Um, and I wanted to note just on a related, um, related to that point that you just made, I have, when 
admittedly, I haven't done my own uh, price elasticity studies for 10 years, so I haven't thought about it as deeply as many of the people in this audience, but um, before hearing your discussion here, I had retained some concern that many of the studies of e-cigarette policies, um, in particular taxes, were problematic because so much of the sales happened outside the retail environment. But I think you make a really compelling argument that um, it's what you see in the retail environment should be fairly generalizable. So I really appreciate that. I thought that was a great just contribution to the overall thinking, or at least my overall thinking. Um, I'm going to ask one more question from the Q&A from Ian, because I thought that was um, an interesting thought that didn't occur to me. Um, Ian brings up the fact that most of the e-cigarette taxes that have been implemented are brand new taxes and that may result in some fixed cost of compliance, which is factored into pricing. But once those compliant costs are concerned, maybe the pass through won't be so much higher. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I think um, that's a really great question. Um, I hadn't, I, I, to be honest, I hadn't thought about that, but I think, I mean, I think that could, that, that I, I certainly cannot dispute that. And I think that could be something that, you know, once we have more data, we could go back and look at this to see if we're yeah. kind of seeing a reduction. What we are seeing, I can say from our event study, um, which I did gloss over, and I definitely focused more on the leads because we were thinking more about the parallel trend. I was thinking more about the parallel trends assumption when looking at it. We do see an, an actually an increase in, into the post-intervention period. So it kind of looks as though this is rising, but as we have more and more data, um, we may be able to see a different trend. So I think that would be something that'd be really interesting to go back and look at. So thank you. Okay, great. And I said that was gonna be the last one, but I couldn't resist. I saw Michelle sure. Locke's um, last comment. And I think it's worth um, discussing this because it probably is worth talking about or at least referring to in the discussion section. Mm -hmm. And Michelle asks what percentage of conventional cigarette sales does Nielsen capture? And does the difference in the percentage of cigarette sales that happen in the retail environment versus e-cigarette sales uh, make complicate the comparisons? Uh, that's a great question. We should have that number in the paper. Um, I don't have the best answer right now, but I, def I, I can certainly say um, that the Nielsen data is well utilized within the traditional cigarette literature to look at these types of questions. Um, so I think that it is, it's a reasonable data set, but we could also do some more close comparisons of what share we're capturing, put that in the paper, um, and that may be helpful just to kind of think about some of these questions. I'm not seeing, um, again, through the ways, the ways in which I understand the taxes are implemented that we should expect wild differences across the two products, but I certainly think we could add that and that would enrich the, the discussion and help people think about the question. So thank you. So I completely agree with what you said. And also I think that the logic that you've used to think about how the taxes apply to the non-retail settings is really compelling. And it's the first time that I've seen that kind of um, teased out like that. So I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to just jump into my overall summary and some questions and suggestions that I have. And overall, I thought this was a fantastic paper with meticulous methods. And I was really um, very impressed with how you laid out the, the background and the methods and just were very detailed about things. Um, I feel like I don't have the um, depth of knowledge to ask some of the very um, interesting specific questions about the, the pricing and the, the data that some of the audience asked. So I think that was helpful to um, learn from the audience questions and I think that you handled them extremely well. Um, in the setup of the paper, when you talk about the balance of harm reduction um, for e-cigarettes, I think that you underplay the role of e-cigarette or the extent of e-cigarette use among youth and the unknown long-term health effects that we are not capturing. So I think it's critically important to note that, you know, while 4.5% of adults use e-cigarettes, almost a third of youth use e-cigarettes. And currently, you know, the number of adults vastly outnumbers the number of youth. But every year that we have 
huge, you know, large proportions of youth entering the e-cigarette market, that really causes concern that I think isn't apples to apples with the adult, the trade-off for adults. And I think that it's really important to note that there's some suggestion that e-cigarette use may be less harmful for youth than combustibles. And that there's some, you, you point out some of Mike's work that suggests that there's substitutability between e-cigarettes and conventional cigarettes among youth, but I don't think that that's a resolved issue at all. And there's quite a bit of concern that there's a gateway effect with e-cigarette or nicotine use among youth leading to other tobacco product use in the future. And I think that really contextualizes the harm reduction setup in a way that shouldn't be just dismissed in the introduction. I think that it's completely fair to say like the data that you have cannot tease out youth use and the vast majority of e-cigarettes are purchased by adults. So your conclusions I think are very, very strong when we generalize to an adult audience. But I think that we really need to factor in the risks and the long-term effects that are really unknown for youth uptake of e-cigarettes. So I think in the introduction, that was a little bit underplayed. And then I think that that's really important to kind of contextualize in the discussion. In the discussion section, well, I want to return um, momentarily to some of the findings that I thought were really particularly compelling was towards looking at the cross-price elasticity by flavors. Um, and I think that's really important to play up a little bit more, in particular in light of the massive movement to ban e-cigarette flavors kind of categorically, and then the variability of flavor bans across other combustible products. So I think in future studies, we should take account of not just the, the price effect, but the policy effect, because there's, there's no way that those policies are not also affecting sales. And I think that that's an important omitted variable. Um, and I think that there's just so much movement in the policy domain at the local and the national level, we really need to account for that. And I think that your study can really kind of contribute to our understanding of the effects of those policies and how those policies, you know, relate to the, I think that it's likely that places that have high e-cigarette taxes also are implementing comprehensive or partial flavor bans that may affect the sales. So um, there's only two minutes left and I'm, I think I've exhausted my main points. So I'll just turn it over, back over to you. Great, those are really fantastic questions. Um, I do, I will admit, I think um, we perhaps were a bit agnostic um, about sort of the, would you, which is a really important question that you, or issue that you raise about adult versus youth populations in the context of e-cigarettes. Um, our thinking broadly was that because we have sales data, which offers many advantages, um, we're not really able to parcel this out, but I certainly agree with you that that is a very important debate and you know, really complicates the, um, the policymaker's job when thinking about these things. So I, I think that's a very good comment. Um, I also, you know, I agree with you that this is a very active time period for e-cigarettes. We have, an, and I certainly glossed over this because we didn't have sufficient time, but we, we did try to make a good faith effort to control for a number of these ongoing policies so that we could hopefully be relatively confident that we were not simply capturing the impact of something else. But it is an active time period and really nailing down uh, the policy environment it is a challenging task. So um, yeah. certainly something to think I mean, about. Definitely. My only suggestion is to kind of pull that part of the analysis into the discussion section mm. a little bit more strongly. Okay. That's a good idea. And we can certainly do that. Thank you. I think it was an excellent paper. Good job. Oh, I have great colleagues. So thank you. And thank you for those wonderful comments. We are out of time. Uh, thank you, Dr. McLean, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 110 people for your participation. Our next seminar will be on Thursday, December 17th, with presentations by Arjun Teotia of Georgia State University on the effects of cigar taxes and Daphne Wu of the University of Toronto on the effects of e-cigarette introduction. Please note the change in the day of the seminar from Friday to Thursday to better accommodate our international audiences.
We are accepting presentation abstracts for the spring season through our online website now. We will likely meet in early January to decide. Please make your submissions. After leaving the seminar, you will have an opportunity to complete a survey on your satisfaction with the seminar today. We appreciate the feedback. You will also receive an email with instructions for how you can receive a certificate for your attendance today. Thanks again for participating and have a top notch weekend.